Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Holy Spirit, open our eyes that we might see a wonderful truth out of your word this morning. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. From the, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. I love the story behind Jesus' name above all names, the song that we just sang. It's a beautiful story. The lady who, tell, who designed the song, her name was Mrs. Kearns, and she will tell you that it actually began in her life way back when she went to Sunday school in the Methodist church, and she loved to learn the names of Jesus. And so as she was an adult, she did, was uh, doing chores one day, and she was in her wash house doing the laundry, and she had put together a bunch of names of Jesus and put them on the wall, taped it on the wall so she could meditate upon the names of Jesus as she did the laundry. And she said right then and there, those words just came to her, that melody just came to her. She didn't do hardly any thinking. She said it just came and she ran and wrote them down and brought them to her pastor and her church the next Sunday and they sang them. And missionaries took this song all over the world. Uh, this dates back to the early 1970s. And so for many, many years we have been singing this song. But she said that the Holy Spirit, and this is what I remember about it and why I love it so much, she described, she said, how the Holy Spirit impressed upon her that this song should be sung as a love song, just like we did it, because it's all about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit said it, it really should be done uh, slowly and softly and reverently. That's how the Holy Spirit wanted it done. So it's just delightful to see from the scriptures when Paul says there will be spiritual songs that the Holy Spirit brings forth that we get to sing that each and every Sunday. And the reason why we do that is because when ministers are preaching the Word of God, this is the written Word of God. But more than anything else, we want you to see the living Word of God in the written Word of God. And this song brings us back every time to looking up to the Lord Jesus Christ and loving Him for all He is and all He has done for us and how tender and kind and gracious He has been to each and every one of us. Well, that's how you preach uh, if you're going to preach on this beautiful song. But I'm not preaching on this beautiful song today. I'm preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is a beautiful picture of the Sermon on the Mount. You see how encouraged those people were listening to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you preach the Sermon on the Mount, you cannot preach it. You can preach it reverently, but you can't preach it softly. 
And you certainly can't preach it very slowly because it is incredible news in the Sermon on the Mount, particularly in the great Beatitudes. We've got nothing like it in all of history. Someone coming on the scene speaking with this type of enthusiasm to those people who had no enthusiasm whatsoever. You know, in the sheriff's office, one of the things that people would criticize Jesus for, and one of the things that I heard all my life as a kid growing up about Jesus is I don't want to believe in God. That's like believing in that cosmic killjoy. Have you ever heard that lie? What Bible are they reading? Have you ever read the first chapter of Genesis? A number of times God says it is good, and then He finally says it is very good. But even beyond that, three times in the chapter, He blesses the world in some way. He brings forth His blessing. Far from being a killjoy, He is indeed the one who is the source of all joy and blessing. And then after we fell, after the sin came into the world, do you remember what God does with Abraham in chapter 12? He blesses Abraham and he says, Abraham, I will bless the whole world through you. The blessings of God still remain. His grace was even more clear. And when Jesus came on the scene, he was that blessing to all the world from Abraham. And he came and he said, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. He came with joy. He came with confidence. He came with a power that no man has ever had on this earth except the Lord Jesus Christ. And he completely changed everything for the good. And we owe him our souls and we owe him the blessings that are even now found in this present world. He came and he said, blessed, blessed, blessed. The word blessed in English could easily be translated happy, happy, happy. He was bringing forth a happiness, a joy that the world had never known. In fact, what's interesting about it is an even clearer translation for blessed is congratulated. I congratulate you, he could say, that you are poor in spirit. You have nothing going for you. You are bankrupt in soul. Well, congratulations. You're just the person that I'm looking for to bring into the kingdom of heaven. What good news to anyone who has humbleness of soul, who understands that they cannot by their own power ever get into heaven by their good works, but they have to look at the good works of another, and that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like the gospel, doesn't it? What does the gospel say? We're all sinners. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. And if you know that, that is good news Martin Luther used to say, because Jesus Christ declared that He came to this earth to save sinners. So if you're one of those people of bankrupt in soul and you are a sinner, that is good news because Jesus Christ came to save you. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. What does the Bible say also when we preach the gospel, which we call the Roman road? It says that, The penalty for sin is death. And we mourn that there is sin and death in the world. We mourn that that is happening and that is indeed the penalty. But here the Bible says you will be comforted. And what does the Romans road say when we have learned that in an earlier time in our life? It says that the penalty of death, the penalty of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How much comfort is in those words. That that is what God pronounces. Then it goes on to say, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. I love this passage with all my heart. The word meek is a Greek word that comes from the world of horses. And it's referring to a horse that easily goes with the flow or the directions of its rider. 
It's talking about a meek horse. And it's not so much our meekness towards other people, although that could be certainly implied. It's more about our meekness towards God. When God says His word, are we like a bucking bronco and we don't want to follow Him? Or are we meek and we are easy to ride and we go exactly where the Lord is calling us to go? And he says, blessed are the meek. And look at what he says. They will inherit the earth. You know, I've been preaching for a long time, so it's, it's incumbent on the minister to talk about you can have eternal life, you can have heaven. But right here, Jesus Christ the Lord says, earth is yours. Earth is yours. And anyone who knows that they have walked in the sovereign will, the center of God's will, knows that God opens so many doors in the world when you are meek towards Him and He is guiding you in the way that He would have you to go. And so your mission for the Lord will have great success. Then it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, we can look at it two ways. First is the way of salvation. That in the way of salvation, we hunger for the bread of life, we thirst for the water of life, and as we come to the Lord Jesus, we will indeed be filled. The actual Greek word for filled means filled to the full. We'll have all that we ever need. and We will not need anything else except for the Lord Jesus. But also, blessed are... Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness could also be about that we want the righteousness that comes from God. We cannot become righteousness on our own, but we need, as Martin Luther said, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that Jesus provided for us by His perfect walk of righteousness on this earth and dying on the cross for our sins so that we might be given that righteousness as a blessed exchange from the Lord and as He takes away our sins. But also it could look like the idea of sanctification, that as we hunger and thirst for righteousness in our Christian life, as we hunger for the Word of the living God, as we hunger to worship God, as we hunger to pray to the Almighty God, as we hunger to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will indeed be filled. He goes on to say, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Anyone who has tasted the mercy of God has a heart changed by that mercy, and it will be merciful to others. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We just read the passage that if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And the greatest prize of all, we will get to see God face to face. But there is a great connection here, everyone, between verse 8 and verse 9. And that is what I wanted to bring home to us all today. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That is great news for you, because you will see God. But immediately, that is not where the blessing should end. Because now he immediately looks out to other people and he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. When we think of peacemaking, we often think of conciliatory work, which of course this includes that, but this is really talking about spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the peacemaking that is most important. That Jesus Christ has made peace between sinful man and the Almighty Holy God, and it is by His cross that He brings those two together. And it is our calling to go out into the world and to share the gospel with others. And when we do so, we get to be called sons and daughters of God. Because now we're not only in the family of God, but we're in the family business, which is to save souls and to bring the Lord Jesus Christ to the lost world. And so he calls us to do that. Earlier in one of my sermons, I talked about the Pope principle from Colossians chapter 4. That as you're going out to witness to the world, you want to start with the P, which is you want to pray for those who are lost. 
And then the O is you want to look for an open door. And when you see that open door, the P is you want to walk right in and present the gospel. And the E is you want to edify people at all times with your words and encourage them to let them know that there truly is a balm in Gilead, as we sang this morning. And I don't know if you've been studying about Generation Z, which is people 18 to about 24, but they have not been interested in Jesus. They have not seemingly been interested in the Bible. They just did a study by the American Bible Society that just showed that in people between ages 18 and 21, there is this huge spike in interest concerning the Bible and particularly curiosity concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. So friends, that is what we call an open door. If you know someone and you have a child or a grandchild who's 18 to 21, this may be the time in God's history in His providential movement that we talk to them more about the Lord Jesus Christ. We let them in on who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what He means to us. You know, Gandhi was introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ, not as his Lord because he didn't receive him as his Lord, but as a great teacher when he was 18 years old. A man who was a fine Christian man talked to him about the Lord and asked him to read the Bible. And he said as he read through the Bible when he got to Matthew chapter 5 and read the Sermon on the Mount, his heart was overjoyed is how he describes it. Now, Gandhi was, suffered uh, prejudice from a local Christian congregation, and he seemingly never forgave the church for that. But I hope that in his maturity as he aged, he would have l- realized that the church does not always follow Jesus Christ that well. But Jesus Christ is the one who is being called to follow, not the church. Jesus Christ is the one that we're to surrender our lives to and receive Him as Lord and Savior. But his heart was totally moved by this great sermon. And so we have seen all throughout history that some of the greatest leaders of history have been moved by this sermon. Even the very first book of the New Testament, which is the little epistle of James, which was probably written in A.D. 37, is thought by scholars to be an exposition of the Sermon on the Mount. That's how Jesus' half-brother, James, was so enthralled by what Jesus had said here. And so you could go through history and see all these famous people who have been influenced by this passage. I'm going to ask you a question. What famous person do you know of in our time that say that they have been influenced by the wisdom and the beautiful mind of the Lord Jesus Christ here. It's about time that we pray that people will get excited once again about the Sermon of the Mount. I mean, the Sermon of the Mount can't be beat. It has the golden rule in it. I mean, the golden rule. This, this Jesus not only has these beatitudes, but in His greatest sermon, He just includes just in a little one-liner the golden rule, and it becomes, all, becomes famous all over the world. How much light and goodness has Jesus brought into this world because of His teaching on the golden rule? Then the passage goes on to say, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we are persecuted because we stand up for the righteous things of the Lord, God reminds us here in the person of Jesus, His Son, that the kingdom of heaven is ours. But He goes on to remind us that there is even more for those who are persecuted. Verse 11 said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And that is the clear proof that this is a Christ-centered sermon right here. Because of me, Jesus says. The whole Beatitudes is Christ-centered. Every one of the Beatitudes should be read with a Christ-centered understanding. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because of me, 
Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We could go down each one of the Beatitudes and read that because Jesus is the center of this sermon. Rejoice, it says, and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I love Jesus' way that he speaks to those who are being persecuted. First, this is an early sermon and he is already honest with people that you're going to be persecuted if you live a godly life. You're going to be persecuted for my name's sake. He was honest right up front. But he says, not only should you rejoice and be glad, because not only are you going to receive the kingdom of heaven, but you also are going to receive a reward in heaven. I am not going to cheat you, Jesus says. I'm going to make sure that you are well taken care of. And then he says this beautiful phrase, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus affirms the disciples, affirms you and I if we are persecuted for the Lord, with, for the Lord because the prophets who were before us, the prophets who were loved beyond love by the Hebrew people, these most honorable of offices in the world, these people are what you will be considered to be like, the great prophets of the Old Testament. So he gives them such beautiful affirmation. You know, I just got done reading a book that I wish every Christian in America would read. It's called The New Christian Book of Martyrs. And it is like the Fox Book of Martyrs, except it's a it's a updated version that takes us from the first martyrs of the disciples all the way to those who have died for the faith in the 21st century. And when you read story after story of people who were happy, who were joyous to give their lives for Jesus Christ, you realize just the incredible pearl of great price that we have in this Fred McGriff is a, a famous baseball player who just came into the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, he played for a lot of teams, but the only teams that really mattered that he played for was the Atlanta Braves. Yes, I said that. Go Braves. And he said something just remarkable in his Hall of Fame speech. Just at the end, he said something that just struck me, and it struck me with this passage. People have a hard time believing how in the world can you suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ and be joyous about it. It just doesn't make sense on an earthly level. But Fred McGriff, known as the crime dog, he said, to be honest with you, just one day in the big leagues would have made me happy. That is the same truth for the Christian. Jesus Christ brings us into the big leagues here with the Sermon on the Mount. And says, just one day of standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ, putting it all on the line for Him, would make me happy. Because God will always remember us standing up for His great name. Though it cost us all as Jesus Christ gave his all so that we might truly have it all in the kingdom of God. You know, the Sermon on the Mount is so beautiful because it centers upon Jesus Christ. Uh, to me, preaching is kind of like a pilot. You have to get the sermon off the ground, so you got the lift off, and then you've got the flight where you're taking people. And then at some time, and this is what most of us preachers have the hardest time to do, you've got to land the plane. You've got to actually land the plane. And Jesus was perfect because his sermon was only 15 minutes approximately. And he perfectly lifts up the plane to center upon him when he says, he, you're going to be persecuted for me. And then in the body of the sermon, he really introduces himself as the prophet the great prophet that the Messiah was predicted to be, when he says that I have not come 
to do anything to the law other than to fulfill it. And he shows us that he is the great prophet that the messianic prophecy said would come. And then in along there, he not only gives us the golden rule, but he becomes the priest to us, that great high priest that the Messiah would be, when he teaches us the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer to me is just amazing. I know many of you have been studying it. But the very first word in the Lord's Prayer is pater, which is the Greek word for father. Jesus, when he teaches you to pray, teaches you to immediately go into the presence of father, your father, our father. But the very first word is father. How can a sinful human being get to go to the throne room of God of all glory right away? I'll tell you why. When Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man, the one name upon heaven by which all men and women can be saved. He ushers us in the throne room of his Father. And then we see Jesus exert his kingship, that he is the king at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, some people will say to me, Lord, Lord, and they will expect that they will be entered into the kingdom of God. But he will say, I never knew you, evildoers. He clearly determines and clearly shows that he is the Lord Almighty and you must surrender to him. We don't get to control him. He is the one who is over us. Then finally, he concludes that great sermon with these words. In my mind, immortal words that as a young kid stuck with me through the years. He says, therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Amen and hallelujah. May our foundation be only on the great words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he not only died on the cross for us, he not only was resurrected so that we might have eternal life, he not only reigns in heaven right now and intercedes for us from that beautiful place of heaven so that we might be blessed. But he loved us enough to teach us. And Lord, we are so enthralled by the authority of his teaching. We give you all the glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.